Good evening. I'm Ken Haslam, and this is Ideas on Model and Metaphor. We're rebroadcasting a program tonight, one that we didn't originate. It was first heard last November on CBC AM's Sunday Supplement as the last half of the virtuoso 90-minute edition that was written, assembled, edited, and hosted by Glenn Gould. In this 40-minute section, Glenn Gould presents the music of the electronic Moog synthesizer through his own comments on it and through two remarkable interviews which he arranged. We chose this program for our Model and Metaphor series because it suggests more about the metaphorical role of machines, more about machines and imagination than anything we could remember. See if you agree with us. Anyway, here's Glenn Gould with a lightning four-minute introduction to what the Moog is all about. As any subscriber to Billboard magazine can tell you, the record business these days is a haven for the specialty interpreter and novelty producer. What with 28 versions of the Beethoven Fifth threatening to remain to each other, it's just about impossible to coax an item of that kind up the charts unless you play it on the piano, as one indefatigable opportunist did quite recently, or re-release at paperback prices an historic interpretation like that of Toscanini for the perusal of a generation which missed being reared on B. H. Hagen and Marcia Davenport. It's a cultist market, sad to say, propelled by a particularly virulent stream of anti-academic sentiment. The sober archival approach, which has determined the psychology of record buying since the advent of the LP, is in operation, however, and Angel Records blithely release the assured inanities of Eric Satie's keyboard works with the same gesamtkunstwerkisch solemnity with which Deutsche Grammophon Gesellschaft will turn out the complete fresco baldi. The days when anthologies culled from everybody's top 20 tunes and artists were surefire box office came to a halt about the time lighter tone arms made band jumping hazardous and development sections were first heard in the land. It's a bit surprising then that the record of the year, no, let's go all the way, the decade, is an unembarrassed compote of Bach's greatest hits, Air on the G-String, Sleeper's Wake, Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring, F Major and B Flat Major Two-Part Inventions, C Minor and E Flat Major Preludes and Fugues, and as pièce de résistance, the third Brandenburg Concerto, an assemblage that not even the Reader's Digest in the days when they tired of abridging George Orwell and turned their attention to an evaluation of Tchaikovsky's better tunes could have topped. In addition, the record of the year shuns that musicologically inspired instrumental authenticity which serves as a built-in component of most Baroque collections. The inventions are not performed by a scholarly clavecinist diligently practicing Nachschlagen as the red light signals take one. The monumental prelude in E-flat major begins with appropriate modesty, but upon the arrival of its self-contained fugue gathers within its diatonic sobriety a marginal spread and registrational flamboyance like that with which Arnold Schoenberg sacrilegiously suffused Bach's St. Anne fugue, and the third Brandenburg, though, as a realization of this masterpiece for nine solo strings, it's at least the equal of the near-legendary performance by the Stuttgart Chamber Orchestra, allows brass bleats to break in upon the triadic equilibrium of the fiddle sonorities. The whole record, in fact, is one of the most startling achievements of the recording industry in this generation, certainly one of the great feats in the history of keyboard performance, and though it's bad news for Petrillo Land tonight, the surest evidence, if evidence be needed, that live music never was best. For this hit parade courting miscellany is rendered on a keyboard, the three-octave electric action, one-note-at-a-time keyboard of the Moog synthesizer, which we heard at the top of the show. Theoretically, the Moog can be encouraged to imitate virtually any instrumental sound known to man, and there are moments in this disc which sound very like an organ, a double bass, or a clavichord. But its most conspicuous felicity is that except when casting gentle aspersions on more familiar Baroque instrumental archetypes, the performer shuns this kind of electronic exhibitionism. And the performer for Switched On Bach, and yes, that's the title, and Columbia Records, whose December release it is, but whose production it is not, should be ashamed of themselves, is no professional virtuoso taking time out from the winter tour for a visit to the recording studio, but a young American physicist and audio engineer named Walter Carlos, who has no recording contract, whose most esoteric musical endeavor heretofore was the supervision of soundtrack material for the Schaefer Beer commercial on TV, and who over a period of many months produced, performed, and with the aid of a friend and musicologist, Benjamin Folkman, conceived the extraordinary revelations afforded by this disc in his living room. 
We asked him to talk about the production of this disc with Gene Lees of High Fidelity magazine in New York. And we also asked Janet Somerville to have a chat with the Canadian poet and essayist Jean Lemoyne about the human fact of automation, its sociological and theological implications. So for the next 40 minutes, Janet Somerville talking to Jean Lemoyne in Montreal, while Jean Lees gets the facts on the Moog synthesizer from its foremost exponent, Walter Carlos. Walter, uh, do you think you were on the road to producing the symphony orchestra to one mad genius at a console playing the whole symphony? In other words, do you foresee the AF of M throwing a picket line around you for putting musicians out of work? They may try and bribe me into starting a training program so that all their musicians can now be reinstated and reemployed as synthesizer players. The number of musicians that are required to run a synthesizer, it's true, is somewhat smaller, but uh, if one is to take the position of attacking these people, then one must also, right beside them, attack the pianists and the uh, organists who uh, put on one-man band shows constantly and still can become legitimate members of the uh, union, as I am myself, as a synthesizer player. Is there now a category in the union for synthesizer players? Uh, I don't know if they list it as that. I'm sure they'll find some neat cop-out by calling me a pianist or an orchestrator or something like this. Although it's interesting to note that uh, Jean-Jacques Perry, the uh, French fellow who inaugurated the Ondialine, the uh, predecessor to the modern synthesizer, is listed in the catalog as a Ondialine player. He's the only person in that category. He's his own one-man category. That's right. Now, the synthesizer you used you were telling me, is the only one of its kind in the world. That's correct. Um, Would this not be um, correct to say of any synthesizer you can find around? No. That is to say, aren't they all individually built? Well, they're all individuals, of course, but they all follow a format. Dr. Robert Moog of Trumansburg, who built my system, builds standard systems, as he calls them. The largest of these standard systems is very popular and is sold to quite a few installations across the country and indeed across the world as a system. You can go from any one to the next and find them exactly the same in disposition, in which choice of modules have been assembled together and what effects are possible and which are not. The rare bird is the one who decides, I want this particular oscillator in conjunction with three of these amplifiers and that filter. In in other words, you spell out your own recipe. I see. I've taken this one step further by spelling out non-standard elements which are placed in conjunction with other modules that are standard modules but because of the particular array that I've chosen are again non-standard so there simply is no other system that has this configuration mm-hmm. um, of course yours is a two manual keyboard are keyboards unusual in conjunction with synthesizers no hell Cologne uh, in um, 1950s used several keyboard-controlled banks of oscillators and filters and that. Now, because there are two manuals, this does not mean you can play two lines simultaneously on the instrument. You can if you choose to do so. Uh, I choose not to. The keyboards don't generate sounds. They're nothing but voltage sources. Uh, That is to say, every note has a different voltage output, and this can be set to give you a different pitch since each voltage will correspond to a different pitch, so that C might be 3 volts, and the C above that is 4 volts, and D is 4 volts plus 1 twelfth of 4 volts. It simply builds uh, in a linear fashion. I believe you told me the other day you um, overdubbed every line on it, by the nature of the instrument that each line has to be put down separately. The synthesizer currently, in fact all synthesizers currently, are at most bitonal, but mostly monotonal, or would, should we say biphonic and monophonic. Uh, it generates really one instrumental sound at a time. There are exceptions to this, but for the album, I limited myself to one voice at a time, one note at a time. The assemblage then into a final uh, instrumental ensemble required multi-track tape. And uh, this is nothing at all unique to electronic music. You like that color and you want to use it for a, a lower voice at some later point in the piece and you lay that down and you start assembling much like you might build a wall out of bricks but not be limited by gravity to put the bottom bricks on first mm. but can assemble them at any place that you 
feel that you are ready for, that you can predict that that one will be right now, and when the final other layers are placed in, they will have just enough space left for them that you would neither have pre-calculated in an over-direction or an under-direction, so that you know that the voice, which might sound too bright now, in the final balance, will blend exactly as it should. And if you make it sound correct now, or that's to say the brightness sound right, uh, in the final balance, that voice will sound lost. Monsieur Lemoyne, you're a humanist. Why are you interested in machines? Well, since my uh, early childhood, uh, machines for me were uh, just as intimate as uh, animals and plants uh, were. Fishes, uh, salamanders. Uh, of course, I had the usual toys of a boy, uh, electric trains, mechanical, things like that. Uh, with uh, one more toy that was seldom seen at the time, a steam engine, a real steam engine. Uh, with the trains, I would undertake uh, long trips. I would uh, very often set the train and go in the next room and let it uh, run for hours. The same thing with the steam engine. I was uh, very happy just to see it run before my eyes, expanding its energy and dreaming about it, nothing else. Later on, the same thing happened with electric motors. Uh, that was a little more difficult, but the continuity of the uh, electric motor was something that, uh, in a way, hypnotized me. And uh, when I was a bit uh, older, I went to real machines. For example, in the marshalling yards of uh, saint Henri. I used some time to see a freight car on the siding with the wheels all rusty. It was there for several weeks, of course. And so this was extremely painful. It was like a kind of a forsaken reality. It was an abandoned car. The fact that the wheels were so immobilized, immobilized that way, rusty, uh, determined in my heart a kind of a suffering. I would come back the next week and the next, the car was always there. And uh, sometimes after a third or fourth visit, the car was uh, towed away. So I was extremely happy. And sometimes also, I was there to see that peculiar car go away. And I remember one which uh, to which I became particularly attached. It was a freight car of the Santa Fe Railroad. Uh, so I learned what was the Santa Fe, California, very far, the sun and all that. And I saw that car being uh, pulled away by a locomotive and I saw its wheels uh, becoming bright again and uh, sounding neatly on the rails and I saw it go away. The same thing with uh, certain organs of the steam engine, the uh, rods, connecting rods and all that, that uh, oily suavity uh, near the cylinder. The fact of uh, function uh, was uh, extremely important in that uh, poetry of the uh, machine. No doubt there was something uh, highly sexual in that uh, fixation or that love of the machine, that I didn't know at the time. Uh, but uh, the uh, political experience was there, just the same. So that the human analogy was very immediate for you. Oh, yes. You had a direct empathy. Yes. With the it machine was a, a process of identification, uh, no doubt. And uh, no doubt that in uh, those different machines, uh, aside from uh, the progressive consciousness of its uh, rationality, I uh, satisfied uh, a need in the steam engine, no doubt, it was a need of power. I didn't have that power. I saw it there. In the case of the electric machine, uh, it was the need of uh, continuity, that is security, which I didn't have. And uh, finally, 
I said that uh, those two keynotes of uh, those two machines, that of power, brute power, with gesticulation, that cinematic, uh, which is uh, almost obscene in the steam engine, and that of the uh, electric machine, which is so discreet, enveloped, almost invisible, were the sources of uh, two kind of, uh, I don't think there's any word in English for that, two kind of rivalry. It's a kind of, uh, uh, if you want, empathy again with the machine. And it led me to understand a peculiar man of the peculiar machine. The man of the steam engine was very different from the man of the uh, electric uh, machine, and so on. Uh, the uh, happiness of the uh, man of steam was very different. He was partaking of a very exterior power. Uh, he would be uh, joyous and uh, broadly smiling, you know, uh, caring about his mission, as I saw some of them do in uh, old alternating engines of uh, ships, where everything is outside, where uh, they had to uh, oil them with uh, brooms uh, and throw water on the bearings when they were too hot, after they had uh, verified that with their hands, they would, yeah, after a kind of a dance around them. Whereas the man of electricity has a much more interior happiness. And it is not difficult to understand uh, that the happiness of uh, the man of electricity is much more intelligent uh, than the one of the man of steam. Now, how did you, in this and in other tracks, keep the metrics steady? Three years ago, I found it impossible to play steadily. Uh, I don't know, something snaps in your mind. You learn to work with a click track at times, very flexibly, so that the click track no longer sounds stiff and rigid. A great many people don't know what a click track is. Click track is the placing on one of the tracks of the tape of a steady metronomic click, or pulse, or bip, uh, as long as it's regular, as long as it's audible. In fact, the more nasty the sound can be so that you can hear it even at low levels, the better. Uh, in this case, I take a, a sawtooth wave at very low frequency, and you have something which is just like a tapping out. And uh, you can you know, give one measure for nothing so that you know where to come in and you uh, redo each voice one after another, listening to this click track. It's a standard technique uh, when a lot of overdubs are being used. How many tracks are there in the Brandenburg? Eight? Are you using all I'm those? using eight. I'm cheating in the Brandenburg. The actual score would require ten string players, uh, three violins, three violas, three celli, string bass, and then a continuo. The electronic tonalities are so incisive and bright and articulate so neatly if you if you choose to do so as I did that there is no need and in fact a, a hindrance is brought about by trying to use a continuo on top of it it gets too thick it muddies the texture you just don't want this so we've thrown out an instrument also all of the bass and cello lines are of the same line to make the voices clearer uh, I restricted it to two bass instruments instead of the specified four but um, as far as you know are we missing one of the sub bass parts no indeed the uh, synthesizer can be set up so that although one is playing a fundamental of, say, 100 cycles, there can be a sub-fundamental of 50 cycles, not unlike a, uh, an organ stop, which might be labeled, you know, 32 foot or 16 foot while you're actually playing in an 8 foot region. But this can be done subtly and more as part of the timbre than as an actual other voice, so that even with the 10 needed instruments, 8 tracks in the Brandenburg sounds the same, and in some ways I think it's preferable to having actually used 10 voices. One track I noticed in um, the album in which you got a very, very creditable oboe sound. Which track was that? I'm trying to remember. This was the air on the G, I think. Uh, which I think is one of the loveliest tracks in the album. Um, that has an oboe sound with a vibrato. It's more than just a vibrato. That, that one sound is the subtlest in the album. It used pretty nearly every module for a collection of very subtle effects. Uh, first of all, I found that, you know, if your goal is to imitate 
instrumental sounds, certain types of brass sounds and clarinet sounds seem to be rather easily obtainable. Oboe always was elusive. I guess that was kind of a challenge and the reason that I started looking for it. You've got to have a little private game going with yourself sometimes to spend that amount of time on a particular color. And I guess in a way I was looking for a very close imitation of a live oboe, although when I finally got to that point, I started playing with it and it sort of went away again, but in a direction that I preferred. In other words, if I could design an oboe, I'd probably design an oboe that sounded like this if it were just for this one particular piece, and then another oboe for another piece. You know, again, this is where the synthesizer gives you a chance to satisfy that little bit of ego hang-up. Uh, anyway, getting back to this oboe sound, um, its raw material is simply a sawtooth wave, and uh, it's... What is a sawtoothed wave? Sawtooth wave is one of the easily obtained ways from what they call a relaxation oscillator or generator. Uh, it looks on a scope like a straight line up, you know, vertical line up, and then a ramp which starts in the upper left-hand corner and descends through the zero axis and goes down to the lower right-hand corner, and then the ramp goes right back up to zero again, so that it looks like sort of a uh, an N, the letter N, but stretched out horizontally without much height. Uh, the sawtooth wave sounds very reedy, very rich. It's characteristic of a great many electronic organs to which the synthesizer should not be compared since there are more differences than there are similarities. Uh, but the one similarity is that they do use oscillators and the common sawtooth waveform is found on both of them. You could not simply apply an automatic uh, oscillator, you know, that varied it just wah, 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 very evenly and mechanically. That did sound like an electronic organ. It starts to sound mechanical. But the total complexity of it sounds so simple. It sort of proves that live instruments sound so You mean the machines created their own kind of man to be partners with them? So to speak, yes. During centuries, we were dominated by the Greek way of uh, thinking, uh, where speculation took all the place and where experimentation was uh, left uh, aside. And a time came where uh, experiments were uh, more methodically pursued. And there, in that freedom, while uh, the old philosophers were still philosophing high up uh, without any uh, real contact with matter and things, a certain breed of men began inventing very quickly. And when the true scientific spirit came into being, things went very fast, whereas till uh, the humanist and the uh, literateurs, the artists, uh, were still uh, working in the old world. In a sense, we think now of the man of the machine as the man who is high up and not in contact with real matter, with real things. The new machines need very little physical contact. Um, will there be a new kind of alienation between the human body and work because of the style of work, the very non-physical style of work that belongs to the new machines. There is, of course, a risk there, as anything human. We must recognize the machine as something of the mind that is functioning before our very eyes. It's an extension of man. So if, in the case of superior machine, the contact between man and machine is not uh, so bodily, kind of a corps à corps, as we see in French. It doesn't mean that there's no contact. On the contrary, the, but the very operation is, in fact, much more human than it was. Why? Because it's more rational. It is, uh, in a way, much more satisfying at a certain state of uh, human evolution uh, to be uh, in contact uh, with an improvisation uh, close to nature, close to a field that you have to survey. Uh, but uh, in another state of uh, the mind, it is much more satisfying and much more illuminating and much more uh, human uh, to a state of law and to provoke in nature phenomena from that law. <laughs> telling me recently that it is possible um, to create
create sounds with a synthesizer that never existed in nature. Yes. That is to say that it is theoretically possible not only to create a non-existent sound, or rather a, a previously non-existent sound, but you told me that you could theoretically cross the sound of a drum with that of a violin. Yeah, actually the problem is only one of definition. Once you've defined it, if you've got the determination, you can produce any of these sounds, but you have to first sit down and define the thing. We've defined a lot of sounds that are instrumental sounding, that are rather traditional sounding, although none of them really ever existed in nature. They resemble these to enough of an extent that you can identify with them, and you do find them instrumental and lends more feeling of an ensemble in a traditional sense. And I think it's a nice way to start. And in fact, it sometimes is more difficult to get close to these instrumental sounds than it is to do something a little bit whacked out, a little bit eccentric. Nevertheless, if you wanted to cross a drum with a violin, you could describe a drum-like attack and superimpose it on a waveform, which when that drum attack is removed, does sound like a steady state violin, and do it in such a way that there's no scene, so that one does have a drum violin, whatever that yeah. might be called. Or you can decide that... A drum in <clears throat> A drum <laughs> But there are a lot of other musical-like sounds that I, I guess most musicians have always carried with them, sort of haunted by, and probably even been unconsciously motivated in trying to reach for in their orchestrations uh, that are considerably less easily described than your drum-violin combination, something that's very controlled type of raucousness, something that has a kind of a random fluctuation about the pitch that's neither a vibrato or an unsteadiness. Uh, some of these things are so subtle that a quick listening, particularly if the thing is going rather fast and is in context with other similar hard-to-describe sounds, can be interpreted by the listener as a more instrumental-like sound. But as you start listening to it more and more frequently, you begin to see that it has a kind of a life of its own and that it is a new sound that has never been heard in nature before. Do you find it strange uh, to connect machines with art? They have a machine between you and the book of art? Or oh, you not, find at that all. not at all. Many years ago, I would have, no doubt, no doubt. But uh, reflecting uh, upon the organ, for example. You mean the musical instrument? Yes, the organ. I would almost say the musical machine, because it's a machine. It has a lot of things, motor for, motor for uh, air uh, and... Uh, a complicated mechanism and uh, a kind of uh, anonymity concerning the touch, uh, la touche, uh, it's the, touch. the touch, yes. On a mechanical organ, if you touch a note, it's touch. Your temperament, your style will come out of contrast, of the general context uh, you have uh, inscribed in your uh, registration, for example. It means that between yourself and the music, there is a distance. The distance of that instrument, which is a real machine. I can perfectly conceive of a bigger machine, a more complex machine, and a greater distance between my work of art. And now, Walter, I know there are a number of technical problems um, connected with the synthesizer as an instrument. There are problems with a good Steinway. Of course. But one of the problems at the moment is, I believe, intonation, right? Intonation has been probably the most nerve-wracking of the, the difficulties with the synthesizer. And it's already a great step over the classical studio in which ordinary oscillators were used. The current synthesizer is far better than that. But it's unfortunate that the ear is much more sensitive to pitch fluctuations than any laboratory device. There's no frequency counter that will measure frequency differences as critically as... A uh, musician's ear will tell you two frequencies are related to one another in a musical sense. So the need to calibrate the device is coming subjectively from musical grounds and not from technical, physically measurable parameters. That could be a little maddening. Um, and then, the, and of course, the, the touch of the instrument is nothing like a piano touch, is it? Uh, this particular synthesizer has touch which is nothing like anything in the world. Uh, it's both a curse and a blessing. This keyboard, which Bob Moog worked on with me, is both depth and velocity sensitive. 
the depth and the velocity with which you play the note. When you say depth, you mean how far down you push the key. That's right. And the speed with which you depress the key can be used to control loudness or brightness or amount of vibrato or, you know, an awful lot of parameters. Sometimes you can use it just to control the pitch so that as you hit the note, it sort of glisses into the pitch that you're reaching. There are a lot of effects that can be gotten by this, but the more immediately important thing is that it gives you a chance to shape phrases in either a timbre or a loudness fashion so that now we don't have a passage in which all the notes sound like they're uniform, perfectly mechanically, laboratorially uh, uniform in loudness and in timbre, but they can shape towards a musical point. And this, I think, is of such significance that without it, the album would have been dull and impossible. But since the resilience of the keyboard is physical and sort of laboring to the fingers, and not at all it makes rapid passages by the idea of uh, the growing presence of machine between uh, the, the work of uh, art and the artist. That's normal. The instrument I learned to play when I was learning music was the violin, which records in the sound that you make every physical tremor that in your fingers, the cushions of the fingers of your left hand makes an enormous difference in how your violin sounds. If you haven't been playing for a while and your fingers have got soft, you can't get the same sound. Um, I have always associated that kind of total response to the state of my body and my nerve endings with the work of art. Um, it seems that there are two ways to relate to a, to a piece of beauty. You're not disturbed by contemplating a work of art which is the result overwhelmingly of the idea the the intention that you had in your mind and not so much of the interaction between your body your movements your uh, passing whims for example and the sound you make hearing you speak of the violin as uh, you did a moment ago I was thinking of certain old machines uh, where uh, similar contact was uh, essential. For example, uh, certain uh, old machine tools uh, where everything was done with the hands and uh, a lot of very subtle information coming to the end from the way the piece was uh, pushed or pressed from the way the uh, machine was uh, uh, resisting the movement of the other arm and all that. But uh, it doesn't mean that if we can uh, work iron in other ways that the iron smith has to disappear or that every contact with uh, the concreteness of things that we have to work must disappear also. It's only something else that uh, comes uh, forth, that uh, gives another dimension to human activity. Why did you choose this particular repertoire? Why Bach? We wanted to find a way of bringing the synthesizer into the mainstream of music. All of the electronic music that's been released to date, or at least almost all of it, uh, has been in a sort of contemporary frame. In other words, the compositions themselves present their own stylistic uh, communication problems with a large portion of the of the listeners even the musically elite listeners and this has nothing to do with the electronic medium itself which as i think the album demonstrates uh... is capable of functioning in many styles there's also another reason for choosing the bach the musicological problems are very minor if we play a phrase and listen to it later on and decide it doesn't work musically then the problem rests in the way we've executed it or with the synthesizer or with the particular timbre or attack patterns that we've chosen and not in the music itself whereas if we're doing something that's rather experimental in all planes of the music you can't quite pinpoint where the problem lies if something really doesn't come across the way you intended it to so it was simply a very disciplined laboratory way of doing things you set up a control and you decide well this much of it we know is going to work now let's see what happens over here how free are we to be merciful to the human individuals who are not at the forefront of this development. You know, uh, how can our new technological culture help us to be gentle toward non-technologized minds? I would like to put up the problem differently. Think of industry, for example. 
the uh, much maligned uh, mills uh, of the Victorian area. They were, of course, terrible because uh, the kind of machine they were using there uh, provoked kind of uh, super concentration of humanity and work. Uh, the conditions were really terrible. Mm -hmm. But those uh, very dreary and bleak mills have clothed more men uh, in humanity than all the charity of all the kings and all the lords and uh, all the saints of uh, humanity. Our uh, most uh, terrible uh, technologies, those that frightened us, for example, the uh, oil technology, when uh, you see refineries at night with their flames and all that, the heat uh, that is distributed through them is much more than all the wood uh, that was chopped. And I think uh, in that way, technology exercises a sort of a charity upon which we have not reflected yet. There is a real charity in machines because it is there to help men. Of course it can be perverted and that way we are not very free among our uh, creations but in themselves um, they are good. So the symbiosis man-machine can only get closer. We can only be involved more and more Oh, certainly, yes. certainly. It is the network of machines and techniques that encompasses the earth. It is the ensemble of all the networks, the radio network, television network, the uh, oil network, the hydraulic network, the railroad network, telephone, telegraph, and all that. So that today it is almost impossible to consider a machine isolated from the rest. It is part of all the rest. So that there is only one machine, in fact, encompassing the earth. And that has a meaning. That uh, machine, stemming from the activity of man, is between man and nature like a second nature, offering to us its mediation. We cannot go to nature now without going through the network. Just as in the spiritual, we have to go through the lamb. It corresponds, I think, to a, a process uh, that is uh, truly frightening, especially for us who were brought up uh, in the old humanism, uh, where uh, certain values were uh, considered outside uh, the possibilities of measurement. It is a process of quantification. And that process of quantification goes, of course, uh, uh, very clearly in the uh, machinic processes, but it goes also in the understanding of man. There are a lot of things that we have to quantify that we don't dare to yet. Uh, probably almost everything of man can be quantified in some way. That is incarnation. I think, uh, in a way, uh, what the machine teaches us is a kind of, uh, well, that is uh, no doubt far-fetched, uh, but it holds, I think, a kind of a commentary of that uh, passage of St. Paul to the uh, Philippians. When he said about uh, Christ that he did not uh, uh, hold himself jealous of the rank that equaled uh, him to God. But he went down, became man, became obedient. That uh, obeisance is exactly the insertion of man in the determinism of his materiality. We have not yet explored uh, the extent of that materiality. It is much more than we think. And I think that the only way for us, while it is not yet done, is by a contemplation of Christ incarnate as St. Paul insinuates him in that extraordinary passage. And in that way, I think that uh, there is a kind of Christification going in the machinic world and technology and all that. It's very obscure, of course. It needs a lot of faith, a lot of hope to be seen, but I'm sure that it's there.
do you think it's going, this music? Where are you going? We're, we're going into the mainstream of music. We're another instrument. We can be another orchestra if we'd like. But once we've discussed certain of these little uh, technical problems, but they'll, they'll go out eventually. You know, the piano was not perfected even by Mozart's time, really. And uh, it, it takes time. We've had, really, what, five years of synthesizer work uh, to base this all on, and before that, only about 15 years of real concerted electronic music investigation. So we're just a baby. And although now we can see that the child is going to grow into a rather exciting adult, you've still got to take one step at a time. And it will become assimilated. The gimmick value, thank God, is going to be lost. And true musical expression, and that alone, will result. And there will be no longer a chance to hide behind a smoke screen of gimmickry and novelty. We'll simply now have available, if you choose to go in this direction, a chance to produce, in the realm of instrumental sounds and timbres and colors, all the things that we had before in the realm of rhythm and pitch. And of course, it still takes a man to ruin it. God, yes. That's one thing I can't conceive of. Uh, as I told you once before, Gene, when I started this project, I felt that at last we could get rid of all of the errors, all of the inaccuracies, all of the, the emotions of one of these poor things that we call a musical performer, a musician, and program everything accurately right down to the point where the composer could decide within a, a microsecond where he wanted this note to sound. And it turns out that this is the best way in the world of ensuring musical boredom that music doesn't lie this way, and I discovered very fast that the more you could make the synthesizer an instrument, something under the direct control and instant audition of a musician, the more likely you were to achieve great art because of and not in spite of the electronic medium. Walter Carlos and Jean Lemoyne talking to Jean Lees and Janet Somerville, respectively, about music à la mode and the implications of that music for our age.
that was our rebroadcast for ideas on model and metaphor of Glenn Gould's Sunday Supplement program on the Moog synthesizer and what it might mean. Howard Engel is the producer of Sunday Supplement, and the technical operations on that program were by Lorne Tulk. We were curious to know what an engineer would think of that excursion into the world of machines as metaphor-bearing tools of the human imagination. Machines, in fact, as images of imaginative man. So, we invited the rather literary engineer, who is Dean of the Faculty of Applied Sciences at the University of Windsor, J.G. Parr. Here are his reflections on machines and art, after a couple of sessions with the tape you just heard. Perhaps it's a characteristic of the human intellect that we try to establish polarities against which, or between which, we can make our assessments. The laws of physics, the ideals of religions, the concepts of moral philosophy all have their fixed poles, black and white, good and evil, positive and negative. And the two cultures, recognized long before C.P. Snow, but neatly explored and possibly exploited by him and subsequently exaggerated out of all context, offer another example. And, conditioned by this simplistic resolution of polarities, we ask whether a man is a philosopher or an engineer, a poet or a mechanic, a musician or an electrician. When the scientist or the engineer protests this, when he insists that poetry is part of his engineering, that his science is his philosophy, that electronics and music are inextricably woven with each other in his mind, his apologia is received with cynicism, or at least with disbelief. But this hasn't always been the case. The Renaissance man, and later even the Fellow of the Royal Society, as the Royal Society of London used to be, were whole men. And if I were asked to give the principal reasons for the subsequently developed dichotomy, I'd point to our educational systems, which initiated compartments of knowledge and still endorse them. But the dichotomy has been more than academic, it's been part of a social structure. Towards the end of the 19th century, Lion Playfair, a distinguished chemist and politician, said, the stronghold of literature should be built in the upper classes of society, while the stronghold of science should be in the nation's middle class. And one sometimes detects quiet echoes of Playfair's words at university senate meetings. But cutting through the common belief that the humanities are respectable, the science is tolerable, the technology is despicable, cutting through the nonsense that separates poetry and engineering, philosophy and industry, physics and symphonies, there are occasional knife-sharp examples of the unity of man's work. Examples which reveal our categorizations as superficial, as a convenience that panders to the limitations of our minds, to the prejudices of our grandfathers, to the convenience of our universities. The Moog synthesizer is such an example. Glenn Gould's program about it strengthens the illustration, and most particularly Jean Lemoyne's humanistic embrace of the machine, not only his thoughtfulness, but his delight in machines, touched with the authenticity of the philosopher, draw together so effectively the world that's supposed to be the humanists and the world that's supposed to be the technologists. They are, after all, but one world. The practicality of the machine, the poetry of the machine. The poetry even of the unseen engine running in the next room. But more than that, Jean Lemoyne agreed that elementary machines are an extension of man's body, the tool is an extension of man's arm, the engine an extension of man's muscle. And then he asked us to see the machine as an extension of the mind. And this evolutionary improvisation, developed by the intellect and satisfying the intellect, is rational and good. It represents a state of mind. Now, where do the Moog synthesizer and Walter Carlos's switched on Bach fit into this picture of a world in which only a few philosophers share Jean Lemoyne's optimism, where electronic music may seem to pose another threat to the integrity of man's intellect and spirit and independence. Although it might be accurate, it would also be glib to dismiss the subject by asserting that the synthesizer, like the organ, the piano, the cornet, flute, harp, sack, butt, psaltery, and all kinds of musical instrument, is only an extension of man's arm and mind. The voice as a musical instrument was supplemented a long while ago by things that were made for music. 
and even in the hands of such a dubious exponent as the great god Pan, musical instruments have not been regarded as a threat to the human voice or as a desecration of the beauty of the natural world. To suggest that the Moog synthesizer is unnatural is to suggest that we should only grunt. Of course, it would be nice if we could sing more, but it's good to have an extending spectrum of musical sounds to enjoy, and we're not the first to enjoy new modes of making music. It is, surely, not surprising that the techniques of doing things, of making buildings, engines, musical instruments, follow parallel courses. Because the knowledge that's available to the construction of an engine or a road is equally available to the innovator that wishes to devise a new kind of musical instrument, or a new medium or method for a sculpture, or a new effect on the stage. The valves on the trumpet, which we now take so much for granted, were introduced at the beginning of the 19th century when better valves were also making the steam engine an efficient machine. The earliest organ, the hydraulis, was roughly contemporary with a practical knowledge of hydraulics that was applied to irrigation and plumbing. Catgut, which cat lovers is not plucked from cats, couldn't be spun into string were there not machines for making string, string for all kinds of purposes. There weren't any brass sections before the blacksmith made brass. Brass for ornaments and weapons and machines and for musical instruments. Until the latter half of the 19th century, science wasn't used very much as a tool of engineering. James Watt was the first careful investigator of the operation of the new steam engine and Carnot's thermodynamic analysis of its operations, this wasn't published until the turn of the century in the early 1800s. Briefly, and with a few exceptions, science did not enter the machine until 1800. And it was about this time that scientists began to put science into sound. Although Edison in the United States and Crowe in France didn't invent the phonograph until 1877, the analysis of sounds and the possibility of recording sounds were very much in the minds of scientists from about 1800. What I'm trying to suggest, and to suggest in broad terms, is that while machines and musical instruments had been made from very early times, the influence of science on our understanding and design of machines and musical instruments happened about 1800. Carnot's work on heat, derived from and applicable to the engine, was published about 1834. Chladni published his famous work on vibrations in 1802. Of course, there had been earlier work on sound, by Newton and way back to Pythagoras, and there'd been earlier work on engines. All I'm trying to assert is that about 1800, there was a great confluence of the scientific analysis of physical things, which before that time leaned rather heavily upon chance. And in the middle of the 19th century, Ohm's work on harmonics, the response of the ear, the quality of a note, brought music firmly into the purlieu of the physicist. Subsequently, Helmholtz made his contribution and published the authoritative text on the sensation of tones. Helmholtz's book was roughly contemporary with Edison's invention, although it's doubtful that Edison owed anything directly to Helmholtz. But there's a sort of atmosphere created by the simultaneous interests of many people, scientists, inventors, entrepreneurs. It's unlikely that the phonograph could have been invented before the middle of the 19th century, surprising if it had been delayed until the 20th. And now, in an age of electronics, it's inevitable that we will all be affected in all that we do by electronics. This doesn't simply involve the improvement of old methods or bringing convenience and pleasure within the bounds of our pocketbooks. It brings with it the development of new methods, it extends the spectrum of our experience. I think it was Elgar who, after his first recording session, looked around the control room and remarked that he thought he could do more for the interpretation of music by working at the control panel than by waving his baton in front of the band. And, whether we like them or not, the noises on most of the top ten tunes could not be made in any other way than via an ele electronic route. But there are moments at which however subconsciously, however tacitly we realize it, there are moments at which there's a great leap forward in the evolutionary path. The internal combustion engine, splitting the atom, gunpowder, the development of the piano from the harpsichord, 
stereo broadcasting, and perhaps the Moog synthesizer. Of course, if the synthesizer did only what a conventional instrument or a combination of instruments could do, we might admire it in the same limited way that Johnson spoke of the woman preacher. It's not done well, but you're surprised to find it done at all. But without being told so by Walter Carlos, we can appreciate that the synthesizer has more to offer than a creditable reproduction of what we already have. Define the sort of sound that's needed, and it can be produced. But I wonder if I can take this a stage further. First, though, we must be careful to distinguish between machines that create musical notes by a purely mechanical means, a means which, once set up, cannot be modulated, and the instruments that are modulated by the performer. The inanimate musical machines include things like the music box, the player piano, the steam organ, the hurdy-gurdy, all of which, by the way, were made obsolete by the phonograph. And among the instruments under the control of the performer, there seems to be a range from, say, the violin, where the instrument itself is simple and the touch of the player controls the noise he produces, to the organ, where the instrument is complicated, to compensate, perhaps, for its comparative lack of sensitivity to touch. Now, the Moog synthesizer falls into the group of instruments which, obviously, requires a performer. It is, like all bona fide musical instruments, under the control of the player. Without this, said Carlos, music would be boredom. But need it be this way? Is Carlos right? Let's assume that I were competent musically and were able to define the sort of sound I want, and to see this in my mind as a complex of wave functions which I could draw or define mathematically. Wouldn't it be possible for me to draw up or to express as a mathematical model the music which I'm trying to compose? And why should this sound boring when it's fed into the synthesizer to be played? Admittedly, I would not rely upon the interpretation of the performer, but nor would every note have the same attack and quality, because I've not simply punched holes on a roll of paper. I'd write subtle variations of the sort I want, not of the sort the performer fancies I might want, into the models that I make for the synthesizer to play. This sort of thing has been done on film soundtrack, where the subtleties are much more limited but the music is drawn onto the soundtrack. Conceivably, if a man knew precisely what sort of mark produced a specific effect, he could draw music to his heart's content. In fact, if I were a composer, I'd like to be able to indulge in that exercise which Walter Carlos mentioned, and which, I must say, endeared him to me. I'd like to have a private game going with myself. And I don't see why this pleasure should be the exclusive privilege of the man at the synthesizer keyboard. Any sort of music is an extension of ourselves. The gift of Jubal, inspired by his brother Tubal, whom I'm happy to note was a blacksmith, has undergone continual change as we have changed. That the extension may be more or less physical, more or less cerebral, doesn't concern me. In any event, there's a machine that interposes between the music maker and me, the listener. The machines change and are added to, would Handel be pleased with the effects of modern orchestras playing his work? Would Bach be impressed by the synthesizer? I don't much care. For, although I'm grateful for the music they gave us, they're not with us to hear it as we wish to hear it. One of the differences between man and animals is that animals can survive the environment, while man changes the environment to suit himself. In the course of years, and I'm now quoting, in the course of years, music grew and climbed with slow steps and through much suffering to its present-day state of perfection. Let no one be startled by the word perfection. When we look into the matter carefully and rigorously, there are, in truth, still heights above us. Yet I believe that if it be true that the Greek music healed diseases, then should our modern music certainly call even the dead from their coffins. As I said, I was quoting. The words were written in 1756 by Mozart. Dean J.G. Parr of Windsor University's Faculty of Applied Science with some thoughts inspired by Glenn Gould's program on the electronic Moog synthesizer.